Today's interview is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about Van Eck's income-focused ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very excited to welcome to Forward Guidance, Liz Ann Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Liz Ann, wonderful to get you on Forward Guidance. I've been meaning to get you for a while, and I'm, I'm very excited you're finally here. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Liz Ann, walk us through how you're thinking about things at the moment. The most popular phrase of 2022 probably was, the Fed will hike until it breaks things. Was the uh, collapse of Silicon Valley Bank you know, just under a month ago. In your mind, did that constitute breaking something? Yes, I, I think so. And and it may not be the thing that broke, but a thing that uh, that broke. And that's just the, the natural aftermath of not just a garden variety Fed hiking cycle. It's that phrase of the Fed hikes until something breaks. That's been around a long time. And that's typically what ends a hiking cycle is something breaking some sort of uh, crisis, but particularly in this environment where the hiking cycle has been the most aggressive in more than 40 years. But the reason why I say it wasn't the is that I think the, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank obviously has led to a lot of concerns about the banking system more broadly. And I don't think this is a 2008 kind of situation, but I think it's emblematic of the end of the era of easy money and coming off that zero bound, tricking the balance sheet, and this being a global phenomenon, not just a U.S. phenomenon. To to use you know Warren Buffett's quote, we all love to do that: is uh, when the liquidity tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. So to to borrow somebody else's a phrase, I think SVB was a naked swimmer, but I think there's probably more, and that doesn't just mean within the banking system. It's just there were a lot of companies, startups, and zombies that were kept afloat or allowed to grow and flourish in this high liquidity, zero interest rate environment, and those days are over. And I think the implications are still somewhat in front of us, not behind us. There are three implications I want to explore of the turmoil in the banking sector. Number one is on the real economy, and the channel through that is bank lending. Are banks going to be uh, more cautious on, on lending? The second is the Federal Reserve response function. And the third is on the stock market, which has been on, on quite a tear. Let's uh, focus on the middle one, the, the Fed's response function, because you talked about the era of easy money is over. It definitely was ending rapidly in 2022 as interest rates were going up. The Fed's balance sheet via quantitative tightening was, was going down. However, and the market has been you know, anticipating maybe you know the Fed is going to be a little bit lighter. Maybe the Fed will cut more. We have this ba new bank term uh, funding program. So is the ongoing you know, bank issues, will that make easy money maybe a little bit more if the Fed thinks it's, it's necessary to restore liquidity? So there, there's a lot of cross currents right now. And arguably, the, the, what the Fed is suggesting via its summary of economic projections, the, the dots plot, is something a bit different than what the bond market is suggesting, which in turn isn't quite what the equity market is suggesting with his actions. So Something's got to give. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in this business starting in the mid 80s, working for the late great Marty Zweig, who coined the phrase, don't fight the Fed. So I get asked the question a lot is the stock market fighting the Fed? I'm not so sure the stock market's fighting the Fed. The stock market is fighting the bond market, which in turn is fighting the Fed. And the bond market, having priced in not just a pause, but a pivot to rate cuts. That's a possibility. There's no question about that, but not without either significant economic deterioration from here or a meaningful spreading of the problems in the banking system. What I think may be the narrative embedded in what the stock market has done is probably not a likely narrative, which is the Fed pauses and then they pivot to rate cuts, but it won't be because of a serious deterioration in the economy or more significant weakness in the labor market or a more contagion in the banking system. That to me is what, what may be disconnected here. I think a pause and then staying there for a while, that in essence is what the Fed is suggesting is their likely path. Whether it's that was the last rate hike, the most recent meeting, or whether they have maybe one more in their in their pocket, 
I think it's the time frame associated with the pause where there still is a disconnect. And at this point, I think you should probably not take the Fed at its words. They're they're data dependent. So they're they they don't have a playbook that they're playing off of and they're just deciding when to share it in more detail with us, you know, lowly market and Fed watchers. I, I think the data will de- de- decide for them what to do with rates. But I think if if the banking system sort of stays fairly calm as it has in the last week or two, courtesy of the, in large part, the funding facilities and banks that have come to the discount window. If we don't see a reignition of the banking crisis and the economy sort of hangs in there, if you don't get a serious hit to the jobs market or you don't see a much bigger drop in inflation than what's expected, then the pause, I think, is going to be with us for a while. And I'm not sure if the stock market has digested the difference between a pause and a pivot. Right. And how are you thinking about the general economy? I know many in the market have been anticipating a recession that the U.S. would enter quite quickly, but the economic data in January and February was surprisingly strong. How have you made sense of that? I know, you know we're recording the afternoon of April 4th. A, a lot of data came out uh, uh, today and, and yesterday, l- last week, about the, the ISM, uh, uh, prices paid, uh, the, the jolts number. What is your take on the most recent economic data? We've been saying we've been in a version of a rolling recession for a while now, where the weakness rolls through different segments of the economy at different times, as opposed to the bottom falls all out at once type of recession akin to certainly the COVID recession of 2020, and even to some degree, the global financial crisis. This is one that's been spread out over time with different pockets hit at different times. And it really, the the genesis of that goes back to mid-2020 when we had the massive double-barreled stimulus on the monetary and the fiscal front. You know, M2 money supply jumped to about 27% year over year. Savings rate jumps to over 30%. All the pent up demand that came coming out of the lockdown phase at that time had to be funneled into the goods side of the economy because we had no access to services. That gave a lift to the economy. It also started the inflation problem, which is very much initially concentrated on the goods side, exacerbated by the supply chain problems. Fast forward to the more recent period, we've seen unquestionably recession conditions in things like housing, housing related, a lot of consumer oriented products, tech oriented products, very much the stay at home beneficiaries from an industry perspective. They're absolutely in recession type conditions. And in turn, the good side of inflation metrics have moved into disinflation. But we've had the offsetting strength on services. Services is a larger employer in the United States. That helps to explain the labor market staying afloat. And many of the services-oriented inflation components are stickier by nature, hence not seeing inflation fall. So now the question is not so much, will there be a recession? I think at this point, it's will there eventually be a formally declared recession by the NBR? I think the answer to that is yes. But it's likely because it starts to hit the pockets of the economy that hasn't already hit. And I think that what really holds the key to it hitting services is the labor market. And another thing that's unique about this cycle is that the layoffs, which have been really eye-popping given how um, uh, sort of frequently they're coming and how dominant the companies are. These are are big blue chip, well-known companies, but what it reflects is that layoffs are happening top down in this cycle, meaning up the wage spectrum, up into the managerial class, the supervisory class. It's the opposite that normally happens in any kind of contraction in the economy is the layoffs tend to start bottom up and then eventually it kind of moves up the wage and income and, and, um, you know, managerial spectrum. And it's been kind of opposite this time. So there's a lot that's just really unique about this cycle, but, if I had to bet on whether the NBER eventually, and they're always late, will say, okay, yes, it was a recession. Here's when it started. And then really late, here's when it ended. Yeah, I think that's the case um, in large part due to a lot of the data that's come out very recently. You mentioned ISMs, the regional uh, PMIs have been pretty ugly. The JOLTS data, we've got a jobs report coming up relative to when we're taping this a couple of days from now. But uh, I, I think a recession is somewhat unavoidable. 
And yeah, in those PMIs where it's a, a reading where above 50 indicates growth, below 50 indicates contraction, it's been, you know, 49, 48, 47, 40, 40, uh, 46. And at what level of, of that do you think the U.S. Will, will enter a recession? And does the Federal Reserve, do is their growth mandate, their you know labor market mandate, the only thing they're focused on? The, the ISM, the, the PMI could be at 39, but as long as the unemployment rate is you know below 4%, it, there's no cuts any 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 so, time soon. What do you think? So, um, n- not to be a, a critic here, but you're you're sort of mixing leading and lagging indicators, and right, also, right, right. I think you, we need to emphasize the 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 meaningfulness of rate of change as opposed to level. There's no level. If you were going to think in level terms, and specific to when recessions are declared how the NBER dates them, level is important, but here's the key. So what the NBER does when it, 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 the first thing it does, it says, okay, it's a recession. Simultaneous with that announcement, they tell you when they believe it started and they date it by month. The average look back is seven months and it's been longer uh, than that. What they do is they go back to the peak in the aggregate data that they're looking at. And the aggregate data they're looking at is inclusive of four coincident indicators, payrolls, personal income, industrial production, and business sales. Now, by definition, if you're at the peak in something, in level terms, that's at the high. So at that moment in time, things look pretty good. It's the subsequent rate of change going down that then gets to a weak enough area level where the NBR says, all right, yeah, we got to call this a recession. They go back and date it to the peak, which is why when you're in an environment like this, where yes, you still have strong payroll growth, you still have a very low unemployment rate, but it's the subtle rate of change. And in the case of the unemployment rate, it's the most lagging of all indicators. We've had recessions that have been dated as starting when the unemployment rate is still exactly at its low point. And the average tick up is only 0.3. It's it's a recession that brings on an eventual increase in the unemployment rate. It's not a rising unemployment rate that brings on a recession. And to the ISM, there's no level that is the key. It's the it's the direction. Yeah, we dipped below 50, and that's generally considered the dividing line between expansion and contraction, but we're still descending. So it's not like there's this trigger. And by the way, the ISM is not one of the specific indicators that the NBER looks at. Now it is a leading indicator, mm-hmm. so it's important to to look at, but there's no really precise level of any of these things. It's just, has there been enough collective deterioration to, to get to the point where the business cycle dating committee at the NBER says, yes, it's recession. It's the going back and dating it to a peak where if you think about how we were all feeling at that moment, there'd be a lot of naysayers, like is often the case when you're in this kind of environment where the leading indicators are flashing recession, but the data in real time, especially the coincident or lagging indicators still say not much of a problem here. It always trips people up. It, you're, you're absolutely right. I was conflating it and you're, you're right. I think the, uh, when a recession starts, the unemployment rate is typically quite low. I think in the 1950s, it was you know below 3%. Oh, and not only quite low, but when recessions have ended, if you look you simply do a long-term chart of the unemployment rate and then put recession bars in and you kind of just blur your eyes a little bit, recessions start at the low in the unemployment rate, maybe maybe a tick or two up. And not only do they end near a high in the unemployment rate, typically the unemployment rate is still rising after the recession is declared as over because it's a lagging indicator. So I think it's certainly one of the things that trips investors up because we're so connected to economic data Mm -hmm. that we often think, oh, I'm just, why don't I just, you know, stay out of the market until we know the coast is clear and we've had a recession, it's been declared. Let's wait till the end has been declared. And the stock market is a leading indicator. You've missed so much of the bull market that, so I, I think just the, the nature of leading coincident lagging indicators and how this stuff unfolds in a cycle is uh, is is really important, but it's also one of the common things that trips up investors. 
You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, equity uh, market is a forward pricing mechanism. The best returns were when things looked the worst in, in March and April of, of, of 2020. Yep. Is the Federal Reserve, are they, obviously they look at forward looking indicators, but isn't their mandate by focusing on the labor market, which is, as you said, a lagging indicator? Shouldn't we be looking at the, what the, the, the Fed looks at? So the Fed has a dual mandate. Um, which is price stability, aka inflation, and full employment, aka the labor market. But they're they're not just looking at like one particular metric of each and going off of some level. And when it hits this level, then they move one direction or another. They know that inflation is inherently a lagging indicator. They get it. They talk about it. That said, when you when you get to a forty year high, and they admit to being behind the curve, probably having launched off the zero bound and started to shrink the balance sheet much later than they probably should have, but they concede that. Nothing we can do, nothing anybody can do, including them about that now. They're sort of playing catch up. So they know inherently it's a lagging indicator. Now it's one of the reasons why they're talking about the notion of a pause because of the long and variable lags, understanding that they're they're changing policy based on a lagging indicator, knowing that the effects of their policy changes are in the future. But they're starting to address that more. It's also one of the reasons why when they talk about the labor market, some of the metrics that they're focusing on are really not things like the unemployment rate or even payroll growth. It's things like layoff announcements, job openings, relative to the unemployed, those are leading indicators. They even lead things like unemployment claims, which mm. is sort of the leading indicator that's it, that's one of the components of the leading economic index. But there are obviously indicators that lead unemployment claims. First, you know, there's hiring freezes, then there's layoff announcements, then there's the actual layoffs, and then there's the filing for unemployment insurance. So I, I think they do understand the need to look at what leads in the labor market, but they also still are combating what they know is a lagging indicator of inflation. I think what the Fed is really trying to do in this cycle is not repeat the errors of the 1970s, where the Fed three times basically declared victory on inflation, eased policy basically letting inflation out of the bag again. They have to scramble with tighter policy. And it was those fits and starts that led to Volcker having to come in and do what we now call pull a Volcker. <laughs> so I, I think that's really what the Fed is trying to uh, avoid in this environment. What do you think about the timeline of the recession and uh, how severe it is, You know, mild or, or, or severe? And to what degree is, has your answer changed um, since the, the, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank uh, just under a month ago? So if you would ask the question pre-SVB, I probably would have said I think a recession would likely be mild, in part because if it was just a continuation of what's already been happening through this rolling recession, just the more extended period of time where different pockets get hit at different times, almost by nature of that unique happening, suggests it's not you know an extreme bottom falls out all at once. With SVB, it's not so much now you the needle points much more toward a severe recession. I think it only would if the banking crisis becomes more severe. But related to that, part of the reason why I think the needle, regardless of deep or mild, definitively points more toward formal recession is what the uh, fallout of SVP has unleashed, which is likely tighter credit conditions, possibly even a credit crunch. Now, lending conditions were tightening well before SVB fell. So that that's not a brand new phenomenon. The, the data that comes out on a quarterly basis, the senior lending officer uh, survey that puts it's put out by the, the Fed is, is only quarterly, but it was it's through the beginning of March. And that showed recession level tightening in lending conditions across the spectrum of commercial, industrial, consumer loans. In addition, the the stats that measure loan demand had also weakened significantly. Hmm. I think now post SVB, <laughs> I, I think it's a it would be a real stretch to say that lending conditions loosen from here. Uh, it's pretty obvious that they get even tighter from here, but they were already flashing recession even before 
SVB. I think that's sort of maybe the kind of the nail uh, in in the the coffin in terms of uh, the economy and recession. But it still is very possible that it could be fairly mild unless we don't see more severe dislocations in the banking system. Right. Th- thanks. So given your macroeconomic view you, you just laid out, how is you go about thinking investing? Let's let's just stick to to the stock market uh, uh, right now. So, you know, you, you talked about a, a pretty impressive rally this year, which it has in the face of everything that's gone on with the banking system. But I think we, we have to think about the rally this year um, in maybe a, one or two unique ways, but also segmented in, in the time span of the first three plus months of the year. So I, I think the early stage of the rally, particularly concentrated in January, where Yet again, you saw a big lift in meme stocks and some of those other narrative-driven areas like non-profitable tech and heavily shorted. I think that was pretty much a big short-covering-driven rally. Um, maybe some FOMO and some of the shorter-term day traders saying, oh, let's try to ride the meme bandwagon again, or let's stick it to the man by going into the you know heavily shorted stocks. But I think it was really just a kind of a a short-term, short-covering reversion trade. More recently, the rally has been heavily, heavily concentrated way up the cap spectrum. So the top top 10 largest names in the S&P 500 have accounted for more than 90% of the S&P's performance here to date. And there are arguably fundamental reasons why money kind of moved up the cap spectrum back into the the sort of top five, top 10, mega cap eight, FANG plus, whatever you know, acronym or, or phrase you want to use to describe that pocket of stocks, it, it's not so much the reflexive, the muscle memory of when the market does well, that's what does well, because that was not last year. Last mm-hmm. year, it was the average stock that did well, not that heavy concentration up the top. But if you wanted to point to maybe a macro driven reason why money has moved into those names is it has to do with liquidity, cash flow, you know, visibility in earnings. And in the midst of the banking crisis and what that exposed in terms of zombie companies and the venture world and startups and survivability, I think there was a shift to let's go where there's you know cash flows and earnings in the here and now or these are long established companies that don't need to go to the capital markets or the banking system to fund their operations so there is that fundamental driver but the top 10 stocks explain more than 90% of the performance under the surface there's been a lot more churn a lot more weakness and i think where there's been strength and weakness leaving aside those big names is somewhat reflective of the more challenged macro environment, not least being financials being the worst performer. So it's been a narrow market, but those names boost cap-weighted indexes like the S&P and, uh, and the NASDAQ. After last year's interest rate surge, income has made a comeback, and VanEck has the ETFs to help bring income to your portfolio. You can check out VanEck's wide range of income-focused ETFs using their Income Investing Yield Monitor, where you can search by yield, duration, and expense to find the ETF that fits your needs. With the Yield Monitor, you can effortlessly track monthly fixed income ETF category flows, yields, total returns, and more. To access VanEck's Income Investing Yield Monitor, go to vanek.com slash forward guidance. Now the disclosures. Investing risk includes principal loss. Visit vanek.com to read a prospectus before investing. VanEck ETFs are distributed by VanEck Securities Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of VanEck Associates Corporation. Thanks, and let's get back to the interview. There's been a rush into big cap stocks, you know, and so you think that's kind of a bid for safety. And in 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 prior periods of market panic, you know, panic, but when, where people are worried, is that also something you typically see? People are rushing into, I mean. The, the large cap names where everyone says, oh, regardless of what happens, you know, this company, probably they're going to be okay. In tough environments, going back pre-pandemic, tough market environments, tough economic environments, when there was a lot of uncertainty about whether recession was coming or maybe even in a recession already, um, 
investors would typically flock to what we think of as defensive areas of the market. And the classic defensive areas are things like consumer staples and utilities and segments of healthcare. But the pandemic era, especially the early part of the pandemic, what became the defensives, not just because just something shifted in the mindset of individuals and said, well, now we're all enamored with the FANG stocks, so let's consider them defensive. They were the pandemic era's defense because think about the ecosystem we were all living in when there was no ecosystem outside of sort of our own homes that we could live in. And that ecosystem involved computing and gaming and streaming and and online shopping. So it represented the pandemic era's defensiveness because that was all that was sort of open and operational and where we could spend money. Now the question is, and I'm not sure I fully have the answer to it, is this just a reflex move back into those names because of the muscle memory of what they represented during the pandemic era, which I don't think they really do um, from a defensive perspective. They actually had that fundamental of that was the ecosystem we're living in. That's not the case now, but maybe a different way of defining that they're defensive is that we're in this lower liquidity, higher interest rate environment. We we don't want to invest in companies anymore that are long duration. You, you know, it's kind of like the eyeballs uh, valuation metrics of the late 90s. Now it's, well, total addressable market. We're going to make a ton of money, you know, 20 years in the future, long duration companies. Now it's, we have the cash flow and earnings in the here and now. We can fund ourselves. We can pay interest on our debt if we even have debt. Um, we're self-funding. We don't have to go to the capital markets. We don't have to go to the banking system. We're stable. We've been around a long time. We've got an earning stream that has visibility. So maybe there is sort of that fundamental basis that makes them the the sort of the anchors in, a, in an environment like uh, this. Liz, and part of the reason I love your work is you focus a lot on valuations. How are companies being valued? What are forward you know, earnings? How is that being discounted back you know, from the present to, uh, from the future to the to the present? From Schwab, you've got a, a great chart just on what's going on with earnings estimates, and it appears that. If they're not falling in some cases like 2024, the rate of change of going up is is you know pretty slowing to to a standstill. Uh, can, can you confirm that? And what does it indicate about uh, sort, sort of forward performance? Like if you were to do you know a, a very rough back test, at what environments uh, do stocks perform well? What- Interesting. I'll answer the the latter part of that question first, and then uh, share my thoughts on valuation. Um, in terms of earnings growth buckets, interestingly. The best performance for stocks is the zone in which earnings are down between 5 and 20% year over year. That may seem completely counter to what we think of as, you know, earnings are the mother's milk of stock prices, but it really comes into play as it relates to sentiment and cycles and inflection points and the stock market being a leading indicator. Now, here's the interesting thing. The 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 best that I already said the best performance comes in that minus five to minus 20 in terms of year over year change in earnings. The worst performance comes when earnings are down more than 20%. That's like the, the crescendo crush recession type compression in earnings bottom out. That negative five to negative 20 is typically that the strongest performance when you're in that zone is when you're heading into that zone from below. And the market has sniffed out the inflection point of, all right, earnings are no longer getting worse. They're starting to get better. And the market has an uncanny ability to figure out, not just on earnings, but really the economy, individual indicators, when things stop getting worse and start getting better, that bottom of the V. The second worst performance, barely positive, almost flat, is when earnings are growing by more than 20%. Because again, much like the stock market can sniff out an inflection point from not getting worse, starting to get better, it does the same thing. Okay, you know, we're, we're, we've got earnings up 20, 25, 30%. Now the path of least resistance likely to be down. So sort of understanding how it works through the cycle I think is important. Now, where we are with earnings now, fourth quarter, 
which obviously that's now basically um, in the books, was negative year over year, mid single digits. Um, that was the first negative year over year post the pandemic crush. It was the third <laughs> quarter in a row X energy of negative year over year. So it was really only energy that in the second and third quarter last year that kept the S&P in positive territory. First and second quarter this year, negative um, overall for the S&P, um, mid single digit negative for first and second quarter. Then the consensus is for a mild uptick in the third quarter, back slightly into positive territory, and then back into double digit growth territory by the fourth quarter. I think that's still too high for the second half of this year, and probably the first half of this year too. Uh, I think that analysts are in a really tricky situation in the last couple of years. Back to the worst era part of the pandemic, a record percentage of companies didn't just guide down, they withdrew all guidance because it was, they just said, they're, they're, we're, we have no idea what guidance to give you. We have no idea. This is a unique period of uncertainty. Companies have started guiding again, but not to the degree that they have in the past. In some cases, it's not just because now of the uncertainty with regarding the banking system or Fed policy. To some degree, it's also companies saying, you know what, we're tired of playing this quarterly guidance game. This is not how we're running our business. Um, we don't want to run our business on what was the point estimate? Can we beat it? Can we not? It's sort of the gamesmanship that happens on a quarterly basis. And that's not how companies run it. But what that and the combination of just the unique uncertainty of forced analysts to do is they're much shorter term in terms of adjusting numbers. And they tend to wait in this environment until, for instance, we're about to start first quarter earnings season. I think it's only during earnings season when they're listening to company managements might you start to see a pickup in adjustments to the out quarter, second, third, and fourth. And it's kind of a domino. They wait until they get the information, then they adjust. And I think the path of least resistance for 2023's estimates are still lower from here. Um, and I think probably the we need to see a stabilization there, certainly as it relates to valuation analysis, because you know, that was the first part of your question. Last year, when the bear market started, really the first half of the bear market was earnings were still growing, but the inflation and rising interest rate pressure was significantly down on valuations because the discount rate was going up. That meant that mm -hmm. you know future cash flows were less valuable. So it really hit the overvalued segments of the market. We got actually valuations down to a pretty decent level. Unfortunately, now the E is declining and all else equal, not that it, there's ever such a thing as all else equal in the market, but all else equal, a declining E, meaning the denominator, puts upward pressure on valuations. So uh, it's just a tricky environment because now we've got the denominator falling and we're not sure how much more or when we finally see some stabilization. And then I think we can maybe do a little bit more appropriate valuation analysis because probably at about that time, would also be maybe more clarity on inflation and Fed policy. Thanks, Lizanne. You, you, uh, your statistics are uh, very, very important about when stocks do the best and worst. They uh, you know, might be surprising to some viewers. So I'll just say as an example of when earnings are down, but forward performance of the stocks is very good is maybe you know, March 2020 around there. And um, like the third quarter of 2021, Earnings were up a ton, but the forward performance was 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 not great. So uh, right. that, those are examples. Um, so Lizanne, it sounds based on you. Know, I'm sort of putting putting the puzzle pieces together of, of a, your your analysis. It sounds like you're not terribly optimistic about uh, stocks. Is is that fair to say or no? I think we're we probably have um, some more bumps in the road near term. But the good news, <laughs> assuming. Not that I'm right, I don't mean me personally, but assuming that the da all the data I look at and what it points to is not different this time, whether it's duration and severity of bear market, the compression we've already seen in valuations, the likely path from here of inflation, the point at which the Fed pauses, uh, breadth analysis, sentiment analysis, technical analysis, collectively, they point to a pretty decent outlook if your horizon is more than the next several months. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say 
in a year, we're guaranteed the market's going to be up. It's just more of a short term. Even many of the indicators that point to a very strong historical success rate for, say, a year out, say it doesn't tend to be very clear. It tends to be still pretty choppy in the you know two, three, six month period of time. And I'm never dogmatic with with any particular study, even if it's got a lot of history and it's you know screaming something that's happened in the past. It's always it's always a bit different. So. Yeah, I, I think we'll come through this, and yeah. I, I think I'm I'm always long term optimistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, to to quote my the founder of our firm, Chuck, Chuck Schwab himself, investing is by its nature an act of optimism. But I, I don't think we're we're out of the woods yet. But that doesn't mean I believe we're in some you know multi year brutal bear market that still has a ways uh, to go. I, I don't know whether the October low holds. Nobody does. I don't think. Anyone should be investing based on moments in time. Bottoms tend to be processes, not moments. Um, wouldn't surprise me if that was the low, but it also wouldn't surprise me if if we retested that. So I, I wouldn't. I'm not long term bearish on the market, mm-hmm. but I, I don't think we're out of the woods near term. Right. And could you just elaborate on the difference between being short term and long term? And even if you know the it's a bumpy ride for the next few months or even even a year, uh, someone who can can sell often they lose uh, they lose the upside because they never get back in and just the right. behavioral mistakes that investors can make even if they heart. make a short term timing thing the time in the market rather than timing the market the time, and 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 it really goes to the heart of and that, that's such a beautiful phrase I think that that is is so important to sort of listen to but more practically um, get in and get out which is often how investors think about investing it's it's by the way. It's probably the most common question I get from the financial media in tougher market environments. Okay, Lizanne, are you telling your clients to get in or get out? And I always think, what a dumb question. <laughs> um, and I, so I have a love-hate relationship with the question. I hate it because I think it's a dumb question. I love it because I get to explain why I think it's a dumb question, mm-hmm. which is get in and get out, you know, all in, all out based on two moments in time, the get out moment, the get in moment, that's just gambling. And it's gambling on two moments in time, not just one moment in time. No one, no one, no one, no one can do that consistently well, no one. And I don't know a single successful investor that has gotten there by making those all or nothing, get in, get out, pick a bottom, pick a top. That That's not, investing is a disciplined process over time. It's not about moments in time. So I don't know the answer to, is it the low? How much more is it going to take? You know, we'll, that doesn't, honestly, it doesn't matter. It's not what we know that matters, meaning about the future, what's going to happen. It's what we do along the way that matters. And the way to stay in gear, especially in a tougher market, are through the disciplines around diversification across and within asset classes. And then the beautiful discipline that is rebalancing. I mean, rebalancing is such a wonderful thing because it forces us to do what we know we're supposed to, which is sort of a derivation of buy low, sell high. I always say add low, trim high, because rebalancing is more subtle shifts, but it forces us to do that. Often when left to our own devices, even if we're not taking an all in or all out approach, you know, we're letting our winners run until they become a much bigger weight in the portfolio. And then when the inevitable, you know, adjustment comes, you're you're left holding a bigger bag there and you don't have assets in the areas that inevitably have a reversion to mean back on the upside. And that's really ultimately what matters. And then the last thing I'd say is that, first of all, every investor is different. So cookie cutter answers to questions around what should I be doing? What should What's my asset allocation be? I mean, well, who's the investor, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Yeah, great point. Emotional and financial risk tolerance can sometimes have a really wide gap between them. Financial risk tolerance, it's easy to do in a calm time. We sit down with our advisor, say, yeah, here's my time horizon. Here's my need for income. Here's my comfort level. But then the emotional risk tolerance sometimes kicks in and you panic in complete contrast to what your financial risk tolerance would suggest is appropriate. Trying to gauge whether that's a narrow or wide gap between those two it's certainly helpful, especially if you can do it before you make a big mistake and then you realize that there was a much bigger gap between those two. Thanks for explaining that. That, that was uh, great. 
Lizanne, I've asked a lot of guests to to define liquidity, and I, I think I still don't know what liquidity is, but I, I can't help but notice that stocks, which are liquidity sensitive, Bitcoin, which is uh, uh, liquidity sensitive, and gold, liquidity sensitive, all are catching a, a quite firm bid uh, over the past month. And uh, you know, they did the same thing during March 2020. It's definitely not my base case that we're in March 2020 and you know we're going to double over the next few months. Yeah, different stories there. I, I don't know that it's one thread that that stitches all of those together. We already talked about the stock market being very narrowly driven right now. And because those large cap techie type stocks are seen as sort of the anchor right now, that's lifted the equity averages, even though you're seeing much more weakness and down the cap spectrum, et cetera. So I think there's a more nuanced story with what's going on in the stock market. But then more broadly, I think the stock market's sort of betting on a Fed pause, taking their foot off the economic break. Generally a better backdrop for the market. I think gold, gold more recently has been less of an inflation vehicle hedge, more of a uncertainty, geopolitical economic uncertainty. So I think a lot of money has flocked into gold, especially given kind of crises in the traditional banking system. I'm not a crypto person, um, but I think, you know, the, the sort of commensurate move in gold and Bitcoin may be sort of of the same cloth, but maybe the the traditionalists who think of gold um, in maybe the way that sort of newer folks believe what crypto represents. So I think the thread of why those are doing well, even though it's different cohorts with different rationales, I think there's similarity in what's been driving gold and Bitcoin, slightly different in terms of what's been driving the equity market. Uh, thank you. Lizanne, you talked about one of the sort of uh, market factors size. So it's the big cap stocks that are, are really leading this rally. What about when you look at through uh, uh, sectors or maybe valuation? But let's let's stick to sectors. What is sort of uh, uh, leading leading now, and and do you interpret any significance from that? Well, tech is leading because it's got so much dominance by some of those names. But I think you have to be really careful about being monolithic on things like sectors. I think this is an environment has been. I think will continue to be at least through this period of, of monetary policy uncertainty and banking system uncertainty, where you want to be more factor focused, not sector focused. I, I just don't think we're in an, a market environment anymore where you can make these big picture monolithic calls, whether it's by tech mm -hmm. or by growth. Um, uh, I think it's more, you should invest more based on factors, which is another term for characteristics. So I think in this environment, you want to focus on factors that represent things that are dear or missing or less available, bigger picture. So some of them are going to be somewhat obvious. Um, high interest coverage in a, in a high interest rate environment. And now with credit availability closing, you want self-funding companies that don't need the capital markets, that don't need the traditional banking system. They've got that interest coverage, strong balance sheet, high cash, low debt, earnings and cash flows in the here and now, not way out into the future. If, it's, if you're a dividend yielding company, sustainability and ability to grow that dividend. In a, in a deteriorating earnings revision environment, companies that have positive earnings revisions, positive earnings surprises. So you kind of cobble together those factors and there's sort of a quality wrapper around them. And I'd say using them to screen for stocks, you can apply that across all 11 sectors. Um, to say, you know, do you like, pick a sector, tech, it's always mm -hmm. the most popular. Well, what tech? You know, right. in the grand world of tech, there's companies that are phenomenally successful that'll be around for way longer than you and I are around. And then there are companies that might be bankrupt in a few months because they're zombie tech company uh, that just can't fund their business model. So that's tech. <laughs> so to, to lump them all together as if it's this monolithic thing, I, I don't think makes a lot of sense. And then Related to that is the whole growth versus value debate, that there's never enough detail that goes into that analysis. It's too often that I hear, well, I like growth or I like value. Well, what are you talking about when you're talking about growth and value? You're talking about the factors or characteristics of growth and value, um, which, you know, the, the strongest earnings growth has been in the energy sector. 
we think of energy as living in the value indexes, but that's where the strongest growth has been. Here's another thing that happens if you're thinking at the index level. All right, well, if I just, if somebody says buy growth, I'll just buy the, a growth index or something that tracks a growth index. Well, what growth index? So here's a really wild thing that just happened that, you know, I don't have the benefit of, of seeing an audience here, but when I mention this in front of an audience, there's the, you know, the eyes bug out and they're like, oh my God, I didn't know that. So S&P has growth and value indexes, just like Russell has growth and value indexes. S&P rebalances their indexes in December, December 19th to be precise. They have four growth and value indexes, S&P does. S&P pure growth, S&P growth, S&P pure value, S&P value. If you're in either pure growth or pure value, you're not anywhere else. If you're in just regular S&P growth, you can also be in S&P value because there can be stocks that have characteristics of both. So here's what happened in December. On December 18th, the day before S&P did its rebalancing, the S&P pure growth index had all eight of the mega cap eight, the FANG plus, you know, Apple, Amazon, mm -hmm. Microsoft, Meta, NVIDIA, Tesla, Google, um, all eight were in pure growth. That meant that those were the only index they were in. December 19th, after the rebalancing, only one was left in pure growth. The remaining seven went into a combination of growth and growth and value. In fact, four of them ended up in both growth and value. Only one was left in pure growth. As a result of this and other rebalancings, on December 18th, S&P Pure Growth Index was 37% technology. On December 19th, S&P Pure Growth Index was 13% technology. Wow. And it was the third largest sector. The first was energy. The second was healthcare. Now, Russell has not done its rebalancing. They won't do it until June. So the Russell 1000 Growth Index still has, I don't know, 35% tech. So even if you disregard what I said about, well, growth and value are characteristics, open your mind as to where you look for them. Even if you said, all right, I, I'm blah, 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 Lizanne, let me just buy growth index. You better know what you're buying because if you're buying S&P pure growth, you're getting a heavy dose of energy and healthcare. Whereas if you're buying Russell 1000 growth, you're getting a ton of tech. So I, that's another reason that I think investing based on the actual characteristics makes more sense than just these generic either indexes or sometimes our generic thinking about what is growth and what is value. But I think it's so important because of how often the whole growth versus value thing is discussed without any context. Yes. And the assumption is that tech stocks tend to be growth stocks. And in some cases, maybe most cases, historically, you know, over the past 10 years, that's true. They can become value stocks. October of 2002, a lot yeah. of the tech stocks that were going to be survivors were deeply, deeply undervalued. But that's where that's where the value was. Yes. And there are, let's say, like soft drink companies that have a higher multiple than uh, you know, one of the big, big cap uh, tech stocks. Last year, toward the end of last year, utilities became more expensive by a wider margin than ever relative to the S&P. Wow. That doesn't make them growth stocks. It just made them expensive stocks that by default were still housed in the value indexes, but they didn't really offer value because they were expensive. So- that's another example. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's the expectations of future growth. Like if you, if you could buy a value stock that you next year will be characterized as a growth stock because its earnings grew so much, that's probably a pretty good. That's uh, great. I mean, yeah. that's sort of the hybrid. That's what you want to look for. I, ideally, everyone should be looking for stocks that have reasonable valuations, but also have that growth either in the here and now or that growth potential. That's the best of all worlds. Even value investors don't buy stocks simply because they're cheap. They buy them because they're cheap, but there's also growth opportunity. <laughs> right. Uh, well, Lizanne, you've been incredibly generous with, with your time and insights. I have a, a final question just, just quickly sure. about um, emerging markets. But before I do, just want to say 
uh, you know, on Twitter, you are at Liz and Saunders and you have some of the best charts and Twitters. And I always Thank love you. seeing your uh, analysis when, when the algorithm feeds it to me. And I, I hope the algorithm con- continues to do so. And you, 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 people can check out your work at, at Schwab.com. Is there a specific link where people can find, find your reports and analysis? So yeah, there's, um, there's a learn tab. Um, uh, you know, frankly, when I have to look for my own stuff, I literally will just type Schwab Saunders and maybe one line from the title uh, so that it pops up. But if you follow me on Twitter, everything I write, every video I do, every TV appearance, uh, everything um, gets posted on my Twitter feed. Hmm. So it's kind of one-stop shopping. The links are right there. It's really easy as opposed to having to navigate the Schwab.com site. (laughs) Final question is about emerging markets how do they typically refor- uh, perform during a, a time like this? What are sort of the various factors and you know, overweight, underweight? Yeah. Do you, you have a view, yeah. Well, one of the key factors with emerging markets, especially these days, is you better have a view on China because it represents such a large percentage of emerging markets. And we've, we've seen um, our performance and opportunity in China with regard to the opening up, but it's not without uh, risks, um, not just the risks of stocks having done well during the reopening phase, but the risks of serious demographic issues that China is facing, the property uh, problems. We have had a bias to, not a bias to international over the US. I don't want to suggest that we're saying sell all your US equities and buy international, but back to the comment I made earlier about sometimes people don't rebalance and they end up with a much larger weight in whatever is done well. I think a lot of investors allowed international to become a much smaller portion of the portfolio. International has been doing better, but our bias is a little more on the developed side, not the emerging side. Because of currency fluctuations, because of the dominance of weight in China, and the fact that, especially with things like commodity volatility, there's also that sort of perspective you have to have, are you on the production side of commodities or are you on the consumption side of commodities? And depending on whether commodities are going up and down, that has an impact on which economies uh, do well. So our bias in the world of international is a little bit more to the developed side than the EM side. But we do think the next cycle is probably going to be one where international um, performs more consistently well relative to uh, domestic. Thank you for that, Lizanne. It's been wonderful to hear your insights. Thank you so much for joining Forward Guidance and thank you everyone for watching. My pleasure, thanks.